If life is a mystery, who done it? Welcome to a special episode of Ye Gods. I'm Scott Carter. Today, the two-time Emmy-winning star of Everybody Loves Raymond, Patricia Heaton, will discuss with me a short HBO documentary from 2012 called God is the Bigger Elvis. And that's all we plan to do. It's why this episode is special. God is the Bigger Elvis is a 36-minute Oscar-nominated film about actress Dolores Hart, who co-starred in two Elvis movies and then in 1963 left Hollywood to join a convent in Bethlehem, Connecticut. And now, at the age of 84, that's where she still lives and serves. So, in order to appreciate what we're going to do today, you have to have seen this movie. And if you haven't, go to YouTube, which is what I did when she told me about it. Type in God is the Bigger Elvis. And then after you've watched it, come back to this conversation. I will now pause. And when I come back, my friend Patty Heaton will be here to discuss God is the Bigger Elvis. Okay, now that you're all caught up with God is the Bigger Elvis, welcome back and welcome Patty. Hi, Scott. Nice to be back. Well, not great. You're you're our first return guest on Ye Gods. Okay. And 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 so this all came about because you were emailing me ab- about the conversation we had earlier, and then you mentioned you might want to watch this. And so yep. I did watch it right before we were scheduled to talk again. And I just thought, let's instead of having the conversation on the phone between the two of us, let's do it for the wider public and. So my question is, when did you first see this movie? I think maybe when it was nominated for the Academy Awards for short films. I was really impressed that it was an HBO movie and that it was it had to be done by just women because only women, I think, could t- get that kind of access to this monastery of women. And uh, yeah, so I think it's when it when it first came out, and and there's footage of Dolores in her full habit as in her as the prioress of the monastery at the Academy Awards. She went, ah, and I believe I believe uh, that part of the reason they agreed to do this is because they needed to bring awareness so they could uh, keep the monastery going because nobody knew about it, and you know it's all I think donated funds that keep it going. So that's why she agreed to do it. And she was at the Academy Awards. Unbelievable. Well, they they uh, seek to be self-sustaining through the right. farm work. And a couple of days ago, there was one of the nuns who's also a celebrity. She's had a documentary about her. Her name is Sister Noella, and she is called the Cheese Nun because they also make and sell cheese. And then it's a, it's a working farm, and there, there's footage of them plowing the fields and tending to the animals. So what did you think about it at, at the time? It just made me weep. I had to watch it a number of times, and I just wept. And I think there is something, and I've been, you know, in anticipation of us talking about it, I've been thinking about why, what is it that thing that it brings up in me that makes me feel that way? And I think there's such a purity of intention a singularity of intention, and it's a complete surrendering of your life to God. And as a Christian, you know that's what your the goal is is to. But it takes it takes daily practice to turn everything over, not just part of your life, but to turn everything over in service and in worship, and to see people do it. In, in the way they do it, and they struggle with it. As you, when you see it in the documentary, the nuns themselves struggle with doing this. So it doesn't make it easier. It might be harder actually doing it the way they're doing it, uh, because they're restricted. As as one of the sisters said, she describes that Dolores Hart described being in that convent as being skinned alive. That's what she said. Mother yeah. Prioress describes yeah. it as being skinned alive, being a part of that community, and that there's no way out. So you have to face your, whatever comes up, you can't go and turn on the TV and watch, uh, you know, Real Housewives. You have to face your stuff. You can't mm-hmm. escape it. That's what makes it, I guess, feeling like they're skinned alive. But it's that, it's that dedication. And I think the other thing that really makes me 
kind of weep about it is Dolores's fiance, forever a fiance, um, her uh, Don, who she ended up leaving and choosing God as her spouse, as opposed to Don, who is in love with her. And Don stayed faithful to her for the rest of his life once he got over the huge disappointment. And it's that's like something out of King Arthur, where the no, the knight just you know commits his heart to his lady, at, regardless, regardless. It's like Arthurian, this this purity of love. It, his love is so pure; it doesn't even matter if he can be with her or if it's reciprocated. His love in that direction is the main thing, and so he. Never, ever. I mean, we live in such a hookup culture that to see someone make his own commitment, the kind of commitment she made to God and made to her. And uh, it's just so, you just never see it in real life. Maybe there's, as I said, like the last time you see it is like Camelot or something. And I I think that's what makes me cry because I think I cried. (laughs) I teared up and bad as I talk about it. You just don't see that kind of purity in the world. We're in such a fallen world that to have someone be able to have that pure of a commitment is astonishing. Well, what I thought of when I watched him, and especially that line when he talked, I've been coming here for 47 years. And I thought immediately of the Paul McCartney lyric, shall I wait a lonely lifetime if you want me to, I will. And whenever right. I and, and whenever I've heard that song, I always think, well, that's not Paul's life, or that's not, I don't know the life of anybody who, who is. And then Don Robinson is that life. He is that life. And interestingly enough, um, this was filmed, I guess, in 2011 and then released in 2012. And he died in at the very end of 2011. So he never got to see this, or he wouldn't have seen the the Oscar ceremony that she attended. What's also interesting to me, and also going back to your to your first answer, what interests me about a lot of the people that we see in this film are are sometimes I think when people make life decisions and career decisions that uh, are predicated upon deprivation, are predicated upon self denial. I will think, well, what were their options? Okay, but many of the people in this film. From Dolores Hart to the very uh, glamorous, uh, sandy-haired woman who we see her hair get cut, but she talks about she's got this big career to Don Robinson, who is a global, he was a global architect and realtor. He was raised in Beverly Hills. So in other words, what I'm getting to is these weren't people with no life options. These were people with tremendous life options who then made the choices that then we witness. Isn't that interesting? It's mysterious who God calls, right? And I think when he does call, obviously we have free will, but I think it's obviously very powerful. And the the very glamorous sister that you, you mentioned, I think that was one of the shocking things to me you see her initially in the movie in her habit, uh, talking about her life. And then they show you this picture of her from her past as a PR executive or an advertising. She had a lot of glamorous jobs. She's British. And she's in a leopard skin dress with a cigarette and a cocktail. And she's dropped dead gorgeous and looks like she's having the time of her life in every picture that they show. And even when she goes to take her vows and enter the monastery, she's in this very bright red fitted dress with her hair done and earrings and the whole, I mean, she, to the very second that she took the vows, she was glamorous. She was fabulous. And that really shocked me when I first saw it. And I remember showing it to friends and they all gasped when they saw it the first time. So yes, I think it's it's very interesting that some people get it all like that nun and like Dolores, and it's not enough. I, I think you'll find with a lot of people that they when you get what you wish for, and then you think, now what? Or what's this all? You know, what's this all about, Elsie? Right? And 
I think these people were fortunate enough to really have that call. Like, I, I almost think, like, I wish I had that. But for me, being on stage is where I felt really close to God. Like, I really felt that was like a church for me to be on stage. So that, I think that is, was my, is or was, I don't know if it still is, because things change. Uh, my vocation, and that's and this is their vocation, and none of it is easy. It wasn't easy pursuing acting, and it's not easy pursuing the monastic life. It's interesting, also the glamorous nun, as we shall identify her. <laughs> um, she talks about though she had this successful career, she talks about alcohol and drug addiction, and then she talks about how she still is in AA. And how she does still does twelve step meetings outside the convent, and that yes. the, and that the convent doesn't really take care of that part of her, so she has to go somewhere else to get it. Right, you know, my sister's a nun, a Dominican, right? So in the full habit, like like these sisters, and Saint Dominic was a protege of Saint Benedict. So the Dolores's uh, convent is a Benedictine. And my sister's kind of, which is Dominican, but they follow the Benedictine rule because Dominic was under Benedict. I had a guy, I had an evangelical one time said, I said, you know, my sister's a Dominican nun. And he said, I had no idea you were Spanish. (laughs) (laughs) I said, no, 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 St. Dominic. Okay, so when you saw this for the first time or on your repeated viewings of it, Mm-hmm. Does that give you insights into the life and career that your sister has chosen? Yeah, I mean, I was just with her for a couple hours yesterday. Um, so I go over and, uh, you know, see her, try to see her once a week. She's older than me and she has uh, some physical issues. So I feel one of my, the, the reasons I'm in Nashville spiritually is that she has a family member there that she can, you know, connect to. Because even though she has all these sisters that she's been with for years. It's nice. Family is different, right? Family you have that history with. So, and, you know, she's talked about, and generally speaking, nuns don't become saints when they join a convent. They have different personalities. They don't, it doesn't just sort of bland out, you know, they have their own personalities. They have their own personality struggles and struggles with each other's personalities. Their life is pretty prescribed. So for instance, um, there was a while there where they decided to try email, like putting an email address on their website for people to be able to email them and prayer requests, whatever. I think it lasted just a few months. They were so inundated that it disrupted their practice and they stopped because there were too many people. And the, the, the focus for them is their practice. And they're also a teaching order. So they, have, they run schools and colleges. But um, it's, it's very much a prescribed life. And within that, as they said in the documentary, there's no way out. Obviously, you can always leave a convent, if, you know, for whatever reason. But you are still a human being. And I think it's, it might be even more of a struggle to live that life than to live out in the world. Some people think it's a cop out, like you're running away. I think it's the opposite. You're going right into the heart of our human struggle. One of the uh, phrases that is that Dolores says early on that interested me is that they deal with people in the widest range of suffering possible, and what she's offering them is hope. And she says, "If you can find hope, you might find faith." Yes. And and then also it's interesting that, you know, uh, she's in Hollywood, but then she goes to Broadway to be in a very successful show, The Pleasure of Our Company, and she visits this convent almost like the way one would do a little retreat for the weekend or whatever right. to get away. This is where she goes and she begins to think about it, but she's even relieved when she brings it up to the Mother Superior who then says, oh, this is not for you. You're too young and this wouldn't be for you. Go do your Hollywood thing. Yeah. Go do your, go do your, yeah, go do your shallow Hollywood <laughs> world. Hollywood. And, yeah. and, but then after that, this is in her mind all the time. And then also 
with Don, and it doesn't tell how they met, but he proposes to her on their first date. And then she says, well, don't rush me. They date for five years. And then they've got, because he's an architect, they have these pictures in the documentary of him. He's building the dream house like like Mr. Blandings, like Cary Grant. He's building a dream house for the two of them. And then Edith Head, the costume designer at Paramount, where her contract is, or where the movies that she makes are, starts designing a wedding dress for her. So even yes. though her intention was to keep this, uh, you know, on the DL, it gets out and then becomes almost like, I mean, in a mini version, like a royal wedding where it's a public event, not just That's a right. personal event. And then at the end of five years, she then makes this decision, breaks it to, to Don, and then he says to her at that moment, Every part of my love for her was destroyed in a matter of seconds. Yes. And then she goes into the convent and he takes a while processing it where he first doesn't see anybody. Then he tries dating other women, but he realizes no one's going to take the place of Dolores. And then the beginning, and you say it's, it's uh, the, the Camelot-like um, 47 years of visiting and we and watch devotion. him watch yeah. devotion. We watch him watching her. We watch. And then there's this very touching scene that people who just watch this will. It's captivating where he says goodbye to her. And then we see him leave, close the door behind him, and he goes back into the world. And then we see her staring at, at him at the door. And yeah. There's a world of thought going on in her mind, and then all of a sudden she pivots, makes the sign of the cross, and then moves on. Yes, and, and her eyes fill with tears yes, at that moment also. Yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, she Dolores says in the movie, eternal love is the mystery I found here. And so how could Don compete with that, you know? Um, yeah. And I think he realized it himself. Right. I, I think he realized that he couldn't he can't, he can't compete with God. Right? Yeah. She says, I knew mm. I could in the convent, I knew I could find my own inner certitude. And for most people, the notion of being alone with your thoughts is the worst imaginable torture. Yeah. Maybe for some. You know, I I feel like I'm simultaneously attracted to everything going on in the world and also at the same time want to just leave it completely. I remember the first time I experienced uh, an earthquake in California, I was in my car at a stoplight. It, uh, I felt what felt like someone pushed the back of my car, bumped the back of my car because it started shaking. And I looked back, there was no one behind me. And then I saw the stoplight swinging. And I thought, oh, thank God, it's finally over. <laughs> I assumed a big hole was going to open up beneath me and swallow me in my car. So, uh, I, you know, part of me, and this is what I was really just still kind of starting out and pursuing everything and excited about. But there was some very much deeper internal thing that was that was waiting. I, I think, and I think this is, this is why I get emotional about this, waiting for this to be over. Like there's, and you would never think this about me. I, I present and I am, there's a part of me that's like a very optimistic, happy person that loves to laugh, loves comedy, obviously. Uh, but there's this other whole side that is looking for that other thing, looking for the thing that the world can't offer. And, and so are the tears being prompted by the sight of seeing those who have made a commitment beyond which you would be ready to do. Because I, I part of this life, I, you know, it would be interesting to have a whole other discussion. What's the purpose of life here, right? But part of it is we're flourishing as human beings. We've been given gifts by God and we're supposed to use them and uh, to benefit others and to glorify him and all that. The way that they are doing it in the monastery without the distractions of the world just seems like so great to me. And, and, and I think we need that preparation because being in the presence of God, I think, is 
the truth about who we are is going to be exposed at, at the judgment, right? It's going to be, it's not really judgment. It's just all this, all the truth of who we are is going to be shown. And so they are kind of getting rid of the stuff in that, in that monastery. One of the questions I ask all the guests is, you think when you die, you think there's a judgment? And um, I do think there's a judgment. Or I do think it's right for me to be living my life as though there is. Well, yes, because I, I, I think judgment is, is justice, right? Um, for, I don't know if you've had actual flat-out atheists guests. I can't remember. Uh, well, Sam calls himself an atheist. But he described it as not believing in the book, though. Right. He kind of tempered it. Well, he that, tempered it in a very interesting that, way. Didn't that, that blow your fasc- mind? That fast yes, it did, because he had written several books and I, you know, I was working at real time at the at the time and uh, Bill was, of course, a big fan of all of the uh and I'm gonna forget the titles, so I will just say that to summarize them, it's like of course there's no God, or <laughs> you're you're foolish <laughs> to believe in God, or you you God, fools, yes. God no way, or something, <laughs> but a series of books along those lines. And I'm going to get him confused yes. with Christopher Hitchens' books and Dawkins' books and others. Right. So when the, when the book Waking Up came up that I talk about in the Sam episode, it was the first yeah. book of his that I completely related to. And it was the first one that Bill did not like. And so that began my more intense friendship with not only Sam, but also his wife, Annika. Um, you have been so exceedingly generous with your time. And I am so yes. grateful for this conversation. Nice. I, let me just end by asking, in a couple of scenes, when we see the cluttered, the tiny cluttered, uh, bird-filled office of Dolores, mm-hmm. on the desk, I couldn't help noticing a Hollywood reporter. And also, she's getting, uh, for your consideration, uh, DVDs. Do you think that some part of her is still competitive with Maybe her peers back from 1963. What happened to Pamela Tiffin? You know, uh, <laughs> right. what about Paul? What about Paul Apprentice? Uh, do, do you okay. think? I mean, what do you think goes through her mind as she leaps well, through the trades? Well, listen, she she was just a true actress, a theatrical actress through and through. That doesn't go away. That doesn't go away. I'm not surprised that she's the prioress, right? She became the head of like she's. He's like me. It's like we go out there and we, you know, that just doesn't go away. What's what's surprising to me about that is I I would imagine she has special dispensation to watch those movies because they don't watch any television, as far as I know, in that order. Now, my sister's order, the minute they can watch, they'll have a group movie night and they'll pick something appropriate to all watch together. But, you know, for imagining Dolores watching those Academy DVDs at her office and voting, it's almost like cheating. I'm a little bit surprised. You know, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, you're not supposed to be doing that. And, and then also yeah. in our research, we found that uh, Patricia Neal helped her found a theater. And so they're once a year, they're doing Fiddler on the Roof and they're doing uh, a Godspell and they're doing all s- musicals. And and that she the now nuns? N- yes well or I don't know it's not the nuns who are doing it but they're allowing they're um, presenting these these productions um, so so well, she's at so last kind you of know come what? full circle in uniting yes well well that old footage they showed from like the sixties when the young hippie Catholics right. were coming there for a retreat could have been could have been your and sister all, like, singing it <laughs> sister. I mean, this is so funny, but there's, I, th- I feel like there was a lot of song and poetry and drama in that retreat that they were having there yeah. together, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah. As, or as they yeah, call it in, in theological terms, fellowship. Um, fellowship. Uh, Patty, the time always flies. I am always yeah. intrigued. We don't exactly see things I- exactly in the same way, but one of the things I love about our friendship is a mutual respect for the sincerity that both of us bring to the same topic that we may never see in an identical way. Well, we're just all on one journey in one direction. We're all going in the same direction. So people are at different 
places. And I guess there's some things you could disagree about, but it's just a journey. It's a journey for everybody. Yeah. And next time you're out in LA, let's, uh, let's, let's get together again. We'll do that. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thanks okay. for having me back. I'm very honored. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this special Ye Gods. Is there a movie that sparks you the way that God is the bigger Elvis sparks Patty? If so, please email me at yegodspodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on social media. Review us at Apple Podcasts. Thank you for listening. And until next time, be of good cheer.